Uh, so we are here with uh, Linda Rinzuli, is a professor at the de department head of sociology at Purdue. Uh, her research is concentrated at the intersect of organizations and stratification in the educational setting, uh, K-12 as well as higher ed. Her main focus is the causes and consequences of charter schools in the landscape of public, public education. Uh, and then we also have Jeremy Ren Reynolds. Uh, he is a professor of sociology at Purdue as well. Much of his research examines two questions. What do workers want from their jobs? And to what extent do workers get what they want? Uh, he is particularly interested in the extent to which employees can arrange their work schedules to accommodate their lives outside of work. Um, and today, they will be presenting a, ti a talk titled Integrating or Infiltrating Parents, Children, and Technology Use in Educational Settings. So please take a moment, if you will, to silence all your electronic devices. Uh, but feel free to tweet using the hashtag Dawn or Doom. Thank you and enjoy. Thank you. Thank you all for being here today. Um, okay, so the the talk today and how we're going to approach this is a little different than some have been um, the rest of the day if you've been here. Um, we're talking about integration or infiltration, and I'm on the doom side. I'm on the dawn side. Um, <laughs> if you didn't catch it in the introduction, um, technically my wife is also my boss, so that makes things a little okay. extra interesting <laughs> here. So we're we're happily married right now. We'll see how it ends after this after this talk. Um, <laughs> we're also parents of twelve and a twelve year old and a nine year old. Um, before we actually start, I want to um, sort of bracket off what we're going to be bantering about, if you will. So ed technology and education um, has basically three. I think three ways to think about it. We can think about the ways that kids use technology in school. Um, so there's a lot of movement towards a one-on-one -on -one, um, technology. So kids are have laptops with them or iPads at their desk all day long. They might be using things like um, Google um, Classroom and so forth. Different electronics in the classroom, that's one way. Another way um, is that parents are communicating with their children via uh, technologies that they're giving their kids. So for instance, I was at a meeting yesterday, a faculty member got a text from their eighth grader saying, take me home, I, I don't want to be at school anymore, take me home, right? So <laughs> they are, you know, it can, it can, with the technology we give the kids and the use that they're, they're using. But today, we're going to be talking about technology a little bit differently. We're going to be thinking about the technology that schools use um, to communicate with and engage parents. So um, that's that, in, that helps us think about our work. The work I do is thinking about schools and the way they're organized, and technology is one way that they're organized. And Jeremy thinks about? Um, I'm mostly interested in work and family issues. So the extent to which your employment activities uh, interact with or are related to your personal or family life and the extent to which those two things either interfere with each other or support each other, uh, the extent to which they, they fit together in a way that works out or does not work out well for you. So if you were here to think about the uh, way kids are using technology in schools, this is not for you, but I hope you stay anyway. <laughs> uh, um, so what we're going to be talking about is this. So. If you haven't noticed, there's been a sort of tidal wave of technology use in schools for communicating uh, between parents and teachers or administrators and parents. There are lots and lots of different platforms out there. Here's uh, sort of a bunch of them. Maybe you'll recognize some. In the Lafayette area, there are two that are used in the public schools, um, at least two. The two at the top here, Skyward and uh, Power School. So maybe some of you are familiar with those. The basic idea here is that these uh, platforms are used to pass information back and forth betwe uh, between parents and students, between, um, or sorry, between parents and the school, uh, in order to let them know uh, what was going on uh, during the day at school and maybe what was going on at home uh, also. And just to let you know that these are often not free um, technologies at schools. They have to buy these products. Um, so they c the range can be anywhere from um, 20 cents a student, um, depending on how many students are in the, in the school, all the way up to about $400 a student. So the obvious question is, why is this stuff so popular? Why is there so much of it? Why are there so many different platforms, and why are so many schools using it? And I think the answer is pretty simple. Um, it is really useful stuff, and we know that uh, by working with things that are very similar on college campuses. We have these things called um, 
uh, like Blackboard, for instance, or Canvas. These are learning management systems, right, an LMS. And what they allow us to do is take uh, course materials, the syllabus, readings, um, and other information, like uh, we can deliver tests or quizzes. We can pass that information back and forth to students. Uh, it's also a place where students can uh, actually go to, to take exams. It facilitates that, that process also. So I think uh, the reason they're so widespread in schools, uh, with, uh, in grade schools and, and so forth, uh, high schools, is that they're useful. And we can see that also on college campuses. So these things started in around 1990, um, in, in the 1990s in college campuses, and I think many of you know exactly what we're talking about, use them and so forth. And they can be really, they can be useful. I will, I will concede to that. Um, managing multiple professors over multiple classes and so forth. Um, but they're not just in, for college anymore, they're in our K through 12 schools and in multiple and um, discrete ways. So we have grade management tools. We used to have a report card, right? You'd get a report card or maybe a progress report halfway through the quarter and you would know how you were doing. But today we have Skyward and Power Schools and these um, give us real-time data about our kids. So I can tell you right now, I can go to my, my phone and I can tell you what my son got on his math test yesterday, right? And I can tell you if he didn't do his homework, if he didn't hand it in this morning, even though I sent him to school with it. So um, we get all of this information real time immediately. Um, behavior management. We used to have gold stars, right? You would go to school and if you didn't behave properly, you wouldn't get that gold star. Or you did, you did behave and you got extra gold stars. Okay. Um, but today we have things called Class Dojo and Blooms. And what this is, is an app that your, ha your phone, you can have on your phone as the parent, but is also happening in the school. And the teacher, if you're misbehaving, like so this person came in late, you'd get a red dojo. And it would show that <laughs> you have a red dojo. And your mom um, would know right away. Right, right away, your mom would know. And you're sitting so nicely, you get a nice dojo, a green one. Um, and, but I didn't, you're sitting nicely too, and I didn't give you a dojo. Hmm, let's see what happens there. Um, so that's behavior management. Um, event promotion, right? We used to have sign-up sheets. You'd go to your schools, you would sign up for something, you'd say, yeah, I'm going to bring the store-bought cupcakes, and that'd be that. But now you can see online um, pretty quickly who's signing up to bring what and what they're bringing, right? So now you know that someone's bringing the fancy homemade cupcakes with the beautiful icing and so forth, and maybe I need to do the same. Um, announcements. Um, so flyers that used to come home. Now we have things like pinwheel and these special um, sign-ups that you can get on your phone so the teacher can text you um, in the middle of the day, all the time, anytime, to remind you that something is going to be happening at the, s at the school. So it's not just that one flyer that you post on your refrigerator with a nice magnet. Now every few minutes you can get a text message. And finally, there's um, visitation, right? We used to have open house. You'd come, you'd see the, your kids' um, beautiful painting on the wall, and you'd look around, you can read some of their work, and so forth. But now we have these um, apps where you can circle through the photos of the day and see what your kid is doing, right? So you can spend time thinking about um, what your kid was doing, when, who they're with. Um, a personal experience on this, our kids went to camp, and um, they told us this would be there. So I, every day, looked to see what my daughter was doing. Who was she sitting next to? Did she look happy? Oh, no, she didn't. What, what, maybe she doesn't like it there, on and on, rather than just leaving them be. So despite Linda's sort of negative experience with these uh, camp um, apps, uh, I think deep down she really liked it on some <laughs> level. And I think... The reason she liked it is, is here's, here's one piece of it, that these new technologies that promote communication between parents and schools, what they do is they help create engaged parents. Right? They create parents who know what's going on in school and contribute in new and interesting ways to the education of their, their children. So here are some of the, the ways that happens with the, the better communication. Um, under the old system, before we had this technology, um, there were lots of parents who were unable to participate in school activities for a variety of reasons. Maybe they worked at a job where their schedule was not that flexible, right? They couldn't take any time off during the day to get there. Or um, maybe they lived far away and it was uh, difficult for them uh, transportation-wise to get to the school to participate in things, right? 
Um, or maybe they didn't feel all that welcome in the school. They were afraid to just show up and start participating in what was going on there. Well, these new technologies, I think, help them overcome a lot of those uh, problems. They encourage parents who might otherwise have been disenfranchised to participate in school life uh, in ways that are more accessible and perhaps less scary. These uh, apps also provide resources. Uh, parents are uh, involved in their children's education in a variety of ways, and you don't always know what the best way is to help your child. You know, they come home with some assignment, uh, maybe you've never seen that particular approach to doing math before, and you need a little bit of a resource to help you figure out what to do. Uh, these technologies can also point you towards those sorts of resources. They can also send reminders, right? There's a lot going on at our kids' school, for instance. There's like, I don't know, at least a dozen announcements every day, it seems like. And uh, so when you get reminders about when things are supposed to happen, that can be helpful so you don't lose track of, of the important dates. Uh, and then finally, they, uh, they're a way for schools to encourage involvement, right? They can reach out to parents and say, hey, we'd like you to come and participate um, in your children's education. And the result of all of this stuff, I think, is um, something that public policy has actually mandated, right? So the policies that replaced um, No Child Left Behind, <clears throat> uh, which is called ESSA, um, Every Student Succeeds Act, that's the name of it, um, it specifies that schools should um, be required to, in some way, encourage the mutual involvement of parents and teachers in the education of their children. So we have these overlapping spheres of influence. The idea is sort of that, uh, you know, uh, there's the saying, you know, it takes a village to raise a child. Uh, this is sort of a similar idea. It takes a village, parents and teachers and other people in the community to educate children. And, um, they should all have some sort of shared responsibility for the education of their children. It should not be the case that you just ship your kids off to school in the morning and figure they'll take care of everything and I don't have to do anything. The idea behind the policy is actually written in there that, that schools and parents should work together to accomplish this um, education of their children. And they do that by um, working on homework together, by uh, parents and teachers helping kids navigate their emotions, uh, by managing transitions from one school to the next, perhaps, or one teacher to the next, uh, by making sure that school resources are used um, in the best way possible, and by uh, promoting safety and, and other kinds of things. So the basic idea here is that we're, we've arrived at a new dawn, right? We have these new technologies for communication that help uh, parents and schools accomplish the things that they are supposed to do. Actually, we're doomed. Um, so, um, um, have you all heard the term helicopter parent? Um, so, a good definition of a helicopter parent, I and mean, we use it in, in lang language, but I thought it would be useful to actually think about what, what it is, what, what the actual concept is. And so, I'm just going to read this to you. It's when a parent pays extremely close attention to a child or children's experience uh, problems, and particularly in the educational setting. Okay, so that's, that's what we're working with here. Um, so helicopter parenting is uh, becoming more and more um, of a problem in our society. Let me give you some things. And the data that we are receiving from this technology in our schools are demanding our action. They are in what I am, am saying, and other scholars as well, are saying that these technologies are in fact causing helicopter parents. I'm actually not a helicopter parent, except when these data come to me and they sort of force me into this um, place that it makes me a crazy person. So um, the idea that you get a text message on your phone, I need to deal with that right away. The data is demanding my immediate attention. Um, these app notifications, so when my son had a class that used Class Dojo, I would get this beep every time he got a negative dojo. Um, so I would know at 12.37 that he was standing up and talking to his best friend. And I don't really think I need that information, but it demanded me to think about it at that very moment, right? And then go home and talk to him about it and so forth. Um, these pictures also, they demand me to think about my action. They make me want to know more and to hover around them, to think that's the hovering metaphor, right? To, to hover around thinking about what are they doing at school, what's happening there, when that should be a separate sphere. 
Um, and it creates this idea of mutual surveillance. We're surveilling our children at all, these, at all points in their day, and that data is coming to our parents. And then parents feel pressure to uh, react and to um, amplify, their re amplify their reactions, not just react, but amplify that. Um, the problem is that students do worse when parents are helicopter parents. And the data for that is uh, pretty clear and consistent, and more and more of it. So uh, kids who have helicopter parents are having harder and harder time solving their own problems. They are they're not developing grit. They are not able to manage their own anxiety. Their parents are managing it for them, right? They're, they're hovering over them and managing. They're pulling up their own anxiety and, and taking it on themselves, and these kids can't then handle it. Um, and Newer research that's coming out is showing developmental um, delays in sort of cognitive and emotional development of these of kids who have helicopter parents, and this is happening from K through 12 and into the college. So technology, uh, so so helicopter parents is separate from the technology, but technology is causing more parents to in, engage in helicopter activities, and therefore we're doomed. So I find it hard to believe that a former um, PTA president <laughs> um, would be opposed to technology that helps parents and teachers communicate with each other and work together. But in any case, um, I think maybe the problem is that uh, we don't realize perhaps how these technologies should be used. So I'm not saying that there aren't helicopter parents, right? They certainly exist. Uh, but I think their, their numbers and their behaviors have been exaggerated. I mean, what do we like to do? You hear a story about some crazy thing that a parent did, right? And that's the story that's going to be passed around from person to person, right? That's going to be all over Facebook and so forth. So maybe it'll even end up on the news. Uh, but I think uh, the problem is not as, as widespread and as serious as maybe we've been led to believe. And uh, to the extent that it does exist, I think maybe what we need to do is just use the technology to provide any helicopter parents who may be out there uh, to find a landing pad. In other words, to take their energies and channel them into activities that would be helpful. And in fact, there are some uh, colleges and universities out there that are already doing this. So the University of Tennessee at Martin, for instance, has a parent portal. Right? You can go to this place and check up on your uh, your son or daughter, how they're doing in college, and uh, learn about their activities and put your energies uh, in a useful place rather than showing up in the dean's office to complain about your, the grade your kid got in sociology, for instance. Right? No, one, no one here does that. No. OK, but when the Huffington Post and um, Fox News agree that helicopter parents are a problem, <laughs> I think I win. Okay. I still think they have it all wrong. Right? I, think, I think these technologies are good. And, and one of the additional ways they're good, in addition to, to promoting engaged parents and having mutual responsibility for children's education, uh, they also promote something that I study a lot, which is uh, work-life fit. Right? So the idea here is that employment has particular characteristics. Uh, you usually have to work at a particular place at a particular time for a certain number of hours. It put constraints on uh, the kinds of things that you can do in addition to your paid employment. Right? And your personal or family life also comes with certain responsibilities and activities that you would like to or, or maybe have to participate in. And Work Life Fit is all about figuring out how we can make those two sets of responsibilities fit together nicely and ideally in a way that makes them both better. Right? That uh, you might perform better at work, for instance, to the extent that you have a family life that makes you feel good and supported and, um, and provides you with resources to deal with uh, difficult things at work or the energy and excitement to take advantage of opportunities. Right? And uh, the opposite, hopefully, would also be true, that your employment would leave you with resources uh, of various source, sorts that would help you uh, lead a more fulfilling and more satisfying family life. And I think these new technologies help us um, to do that. So school, the school day takes place in a particular location over a certain number of hours, right? It is not flexible. 
And many workplaces are not all that flexible either. Right? If you um, work at a factory job, for instance, you may be expected to show up at 9 o'clock, you work in that particular place until 5 o'clock, and then you leave. You don't have much say over when you start or stop or how many hours you work or things like that. And so if you take these two inflexible schedules, the school schedule and the work schedule, and try to put them together, there's a pretty good chance that they're not going to fit very well, that they're going to leave you in a situation where you have trouble fulfilling your responsibilities well on both ends. And I think these new technologies help us to some extent to get around that. That if you can communicate with your uh, child's teachers at any time that you want, you can send an email or a text message, they don't have to read it right then, but you can, you can send the information or the question to them whenever you want. And it doesn't matter where you are. You can be uh, at home on the sofa while you're doing it. Um, that makes things easier for you. Uh, in short, these technologies help us overcome time barriers. Uh, they help us overcome uh, barriers of, of geography or space. Uh, in some cases, they can even help us overcome language barriers. You know, if there are uh, lots of families or children who um, are learning English as a, as a second or third language, um, these, some of these apps can help with uh, translation issues, right? So uh, they provide all kinds of uh, additional benefits uh, for us. And despite what Linda is going to say in a moment, she loves to be able to sit at home on the sofa with her smartphone and take care of uh, school-related things rather than having to get up and get dressed and go into school uh, to meet with our kids' parents. So I don't believe what she's going to tell you in just a second. Um, and so the... The outcome here is that it will promote, I think, student achievement and school performance uh, at the, right at the school level, um, and perhaps safety issues, and even facilitate community uh, engagement. It allows people who are not directly involved in the schools to become involved uh, in ways that they might not have been otherwise. Just got it wrong again. <laughs> okay, so actually, this technology increases our work-life conflict, right? So I'm going to read you another piece of information. Uh, so work-life conflict is a form of inter-role conflict that occurs when the energy, time, and behavior demands of the work role conflicts, conflicts with the family or personal life roles. So what I argue is that, again, this data delivery, it becomes intrusive, incessant and irrelevant. So what happens is that <laughs> you get um, these data, you get a text. I mean, I might have a text right now that I had to, I had to silence because I'm here, but if I didn't, um, it would come on and I would then start thinking about it. And so what it's going to do is reduce my ability to be a good worker when I need to be a worker, right? When I need to be an employee concentrating on my job and concentrating on the behaviors of, and the tasks at hand, I'm distracted by this incessant and intrusive data that could wait till later. Right? And it also could be irrelevant data. Do I need to know right now at 2.20 that my son is standing on his chair? Probably not. I can deal with that later. Right? It's not something I need to, to know now. Um, I might not need to know it at all. Maybe the teacher can handle that situation and not enter into my role as the mother and a worker. So the, what's happening is that the data becomes so incessant that it is actually reducing the, um, the my, my ability to be a good worker. And that isn't good for employees, right, or employers, right? I think employers need to think about this too. How is this technology affecting the bottom line? So it's causing what, what I've just sort of mentioned is this idea of a permeable barrier. So barriers before of the time and space that Jeremy just told us about um, are now permeable and increasing my anxiety, my distraction, conflict. And there's one other point that I haven't yet mentioned, which is um, a spillover effect. This idea that what happens in one sphere of your life spills over to another and can cause lots of anxiety. And this may be happening for our kids, right? So when our children leave school, they come home and now they are bombarded with the information that I have received about them not doing what they were supposed to be doing, right? So Luca's on his chair and I have to now talk to him about it because I got this information and how can I possibly ignore it? When if it really wasn't a problem, the teacher 
didn't, wouldn't have told me in the past. It only becomes a problem when the teacher says, you know, this happens every day, and now we need to sit down and talk about it. But now the one misbehaved um, action becomes um, anxiety-provoking for this child in the home as well as in the classroom. And the technology is inducing that behavior, in amplifying um, parents to conduct um, behavioral modification of our kids when really maturation would just do it on its own. So. All right. So one of these uh, things that these communication technologies do, as Linda was just hinting at, is that they deliver data. Right? And I know my, my, my wife loves data. Right? She's a quantitative sociologist. She does this for her job. She gathers data analyzes it to make decisions, right? How could she possibly be opposed to having more data about what's happening at school and how our children are doing at school and how the schools are doing? It just doesn't make any sense, right? Um, here's a little snapshot of one of these uh, uh, apps that people might use. It's nice color-coded little circles, gives you an overview of, of how your child is doing in various ways. And uh, this sort of data delivery uh, results in um, and this technology allows for better de uh, data delivery of the kind that we're interested in, right? The, the data are timely. They're up to date rather than three months old, like the information on the report card uh, might be in many ways. It's systematic, right? It's, it's gathered on a regular basis using particular procedures, so um, you, you have a good idea what it means. Uh, and it's comprehensive, right? I mean, let me tell you a little story about our, our son. When he was in preschool, um, he, he went to school one day and, um, you know, did his stuff and came home and we asked him, you know, how, how was school today? What would you do? Was there anything exciting? And he gave us his usual, usual answer, which was no, right? We did nothing. And um, so we, we kind of expected that, you know, and prodded him a little bit to get a little more information. And, you know, he said, yeah, okay, we, we went outside or we played in the playground or something like that. And so we were satisfied until we found out later that they had this big event where they brought sheep to the school, right? Like the farmers showed up with their animals and paraded them around and the kids got to pet them. I mean, it was like a totally special day, right? And did our child tell us anything about this? No, right? Um, but if we had these sorts of communication technologies uh, back then, we would have had all kinds of information. We would have had pictures of him petting the sheep and you know, we would have known exactly what was happening. Um, and that behavior hasn't disappeared. Uh, some of you may be familiar with the, um, the West Lafayette school system. They just opened a brand new school um, and uh, left a, a different one. And um, on the first day that our son was in that school, right, the first day in this brand new, giant, shiny school that he had you know, never really been in before, I asked him, so how was your day? Anything out of the ordinary? Nope. <laughs> so. This delivery of data, right? Um, it helps increase knowledge. Both, uh, it helps parents learn about the schools and what their kids were doing. It helps schools learn about parents and how they can support the families in their communities. It can provide, in many cases, I think, peace of mind. You know, so uh, if you're concerned about how your child is going to do in school, you don't have to wait until the parent-teacher conference or to the report card. You know, the end of the first quarter or something to figure out how your child is doing, you will know as things go along. And that allows you to be proactive, right? You can see things starting to head off maybe in a direction that you don't like, and you can intervene proactively to make sure things, uh, the, the course gets corrected. And I think it also promotes responsibility of parents and teachers. It, it helps them keep each other accountable. Okay, I do like data. That, that is true, and anybody knows me, I do like data. However, um, we're doomed because bad data is, is worse than, than no data. And um, I think this technology produces what I've been calling um, a technology daze, right, or data daze. Um, so it's largely one-way flow. So what, what happens is the teacher um, sends this data to parents in, through these apps, whether it be grades or phone, um, uh, behavior apps, and so forth. And the problem is it's really inconsistent, right? So inconsistent data is not good data. We don't, we don't, as social scientists, we don't want data that we can't trust. It's not reliable. So for example, um, our poor son, we're, we're really um, doing a number on him, but um, he, uh, 
his teacher used Class Dojo, which was the behavior app I told you that you would get a red app or a green app, a green uh, dojo. And he comes home, and that day he had five red dojos and ten green dojos. And so we're like, okay, well you did better, I guess, right? What, right? Is that better? I don't know. So then the next day he has two red dojos, but only three green dojos. What what happened? Are those is that the same behavior that day? What what does this all mean, right? Um, that's one teacher. The next year, he has another teacher. And she never gives red dojos. We just have 20 um, uh, green dojos, but sometimes there's only two green dojos. And then I talk to a mom, and she says her son gets 40 dojos, red do uh, green dojos a day. It's like, oh, wait a second, my kid only got 10. What happened? I don't know what this mean, right? Um, my daughter, I will. Uh, let's talk about her for a second. Um, so she's. Um, kind of an angel like I we're very lucky knock on wood really no trouble but she never gets the green dojos the teachers ignore her because she always sits she never does really anything wrong um, and so she's completely ignored and one day after second grade do you remember this she came home crying and she said that um, just say Jane sitting next to her um, who is a behavior problem in the classroom got a bunch of dojos, and she said, but I sat all day, I did all of my work, I, I, I couldn't have been any better, why don't I get any dojos? What does the data mean, right? What, is, what, what are we getting, right? If we're not getting good data, then I don't want data at all. Um, so it, it's uninterpretable, right? It's inconsistent, and it's uninterpretable. And there's another part of this data that's worrisome, and that's the vulnerability of the data. Um, these are companies that are coming into our school selling us a technology. What are they doing with the data? Where is it stored? Who has access to the data? Um, you can read on Dojo if you, f if you feel like it. Um, you can go and look and they have a privacy policy and they say it's all secure. We've heard that before, haven't we? Um, what is this going to be used for for kids? Uh, I'm particularly concerned for um, thinking about kids in our inner cities who might not be getting all the many good dojos, and we know that there's race and class differences in how teachers perceive behavior. What are they going to be using with these data? So this data uh, uh, spam, I say, increases our overload, too much information that we can't interpret. Um, it can cause labeling of some kids the kid who always gets a green dojo. One thing I should notice uh, in our picture here is that um, that picture can be on the screen in, your, in the kid's classroom. So in other words, all the kids in the room can see who has how many dojos uh, of what kind. Um, and if you're a volunteer come, walking through, you can just look in and see somebody has, you know, this poor kid over here, Pete, he's got those two, he's the only, class in the, in the only person in the class with two red dojos. What's going on with Pete? Maybe I don't want my son to be friends with Pete anymore. Right. Um, okay, and so this in, that's the invasion of privacy that I'm sort of getting at, that you know too much about, uh, other people can know too much about what's happening with your kids. So I think maybe the problem here is that we're just a little freaked out by new technology sometimes, right? Um, in days past, we were scared of all kinds of things, right? We thought that telephones were going to be something bad because they would disturb the peace and quiet that existed in homes, right? We thought that uh, clocks would be bad because they would dehumanize factory workers, that they were going to turn us all into robots. We were afraid of radio and television because we thought they would promote uh, commercialism and status anxieties and so forth. We were afraid of all of these things. How many people here want to get rid of Telephones and clocks and radios and television. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Doom. <laughs> I, think, I think not that many people, right? Um, so what I would say, I guess, is that um, we shouldn't be guided by our fear, right? I mean, yeah, these technologies could be misused, perhaps, right? There are probably good and bad ways to use them, but uh, we shouldn't make decisions out of fear. We should pay attention to our fears, perhaps, and use those as a way to design best uses of these technologies and make sure we get the best um, things out of them. Or we could heed the warning signs. Um, so when we plan for the future, we want to think about 
what the, sign, what the warning signs now are of these technologies, right? Creating dependency, distraction, data overload, data abuse and breaches, the digital divide, not all parents even have access to these data, which I didn't mention before, um, and the commercialization of education. Technology in schools is a billion dollar uh, industry, right? So we are we're spending our money on these technologies, right? Um, so school communication technology does lead to helicopter parents, bad, work-life conflict, bad, and data deluge, not so good. I think instead of focusing on those things, we should focus on the rewards, right? This dawn and doom series is all about risks and rewards. The suggestion is that there are always both, right? We should pay attention to the rewards here and try to maximize those. These new technologies help parents and teachers do what they're supposed to do. They help them share responsibility for education. They help parents and teachers in schools communicate with each other. They help parents and teachers get involved in each other's lives to better support students and each other. They provide us with information that helps us make good decisions. And uh, they help us to be proactive. Right? They do all kinds of good things for us, and we should pay attention to those and reap the rewards that are there that these technologies can generate for us. I think there's no doubt that, that plugged in parents, involved parents, engaged parents, uh, help kids succeed. And these technologies help them do that. Okay. I'll say it again. So it's promoting these helicopter parents. So engaged parents, sure, I'm on, I'm on board. And engaged parents, a good, a good thing. Plenty of research um, in the education field that tells us that. But when we go too far, the technology pushes us too far, we become these helicopter parents. The privacy issues are something we need to consider and really be worried about. Um, the misuse of these data are things that um, are a risk that, that um, I don't know, do you want to put your kids at risk? I don't know. Um, reduces their ind independence and increases their anxiety. So plugged in parents will stifle our children. So is it a new dawn <laughs> or are we doomed? <laughs> I guess we can take questions now. That works. Hi. Um, so I have a question about previous research. Is there any research on if these technologies uh, impact how teachers interact with parents? Uh, and if so, um, what what is that? Is it good, bad? Yeah. Um, so the research on um, how teachers react to these um, uh, technologies is mixed, right? So they uh, haven't done any large-scale quantitative studies of this, but there have been some qualitative studies of schools uh, interviewing teachers. I think the one I'm thinking of, I believe, was in Texas of 150 um, teachers. And um, what they found is sort of mixed I ideas, right? The idea that they can um, cross uh, over to families that were disengaged was definitely a benefit. One of the things they didn't like is that they added, it adds more work to their day, right? To have to think about um, making sure the dojos are clear and so forth. Um, and uh, putting, they might have a grade book, and now they have to put that grade book into Skyward or what have you. So they find that the, um, the bureaucracy of the technology is problematic, but reaching some parents they did find, they did find useful. There is some research that says, I guess I have to be over here and Dawn for a second, that uh, it has increased the number of parents that engage in the school. Uh, really enjoyed the presentation. You two are fantastic. And I know you're great parents. <laughs> and your discussions don't happen in front of the kids. Um, so that's really fun. Um, I, my wife and I parented uh, kids born in 96 and 98. We saw this transition. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just incredible old world and, and new world. And we feel so thankful they were finished. <laughs> and both of them are in college, you know, one here at Purdue and another at Georgia Tech. And um, the reason I'm saying that, also my wife is a school teacher. Mm -hmm. My father-in-law is the superintendent of schools. Um, so the question I want to ask um, is uh, for the young people here who are our parents or will soon to be parents, right? Um, 
I have great respect for teachers, okay? Um, however, there are times when teachers are, you know, just human and they, they get caught up in, you know, things, you know, philosophies or ideas and they're always just swinging, you know, new math and then, oh no, not new math anymore. We're going back to the old school stuff. That's what works. Or, you know, just all that, right? And so my question is how, what advice can you give young people, parents or soon to be parents about dealing with school systems? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, I've been called a helicopter parent plenty of times, right? And I'm like, no, this is not helicopter parenting. It's consistent parenting with our values. And the evidence, the outcome of both of our kids can show, it shows, right, the independence. You know, they're totally on their own, right? And um, so how can you help young people better make decisions, you know, for themselves about what kind of parent they want to be? Because I see people saying, oh, no, oh, I can't do that because they would think I'm a helicopter parent. And I'm telling them, do what you think is right because the school system's just going like this. And your consistency as a parent is more important than just sticking with the current, you know, philosophy. So is that a good question? Yeah, that's, I think um, yeah. it's a hard question because I'm, uh, I don't think I have the right to give any parenting advice, but um, what I, I would say is that the, the research shows that engaged parents are good for kids, they're good for communities, um, overall they're good, right? So an, one engaged parent in a school increases the likelihood the rest of the school is going to do better. So the idea is that for every one parent is what I'm saying. So, um, so engagement in the schools and with your own kids is both individually useful and communally useful. So that's a good thing, right? Um, the question is when we get so far that we become concentrated and um, concerned with only our child, right? And making sure that they are taking care of everything for them, right? So parents have always been involved or need to be involved with uh, when something goes wrong, right? Um, it's getting involved before it went wrong, I think is really, really the question. So it's a balance between engagement and hovering. I guess I would say that um, the idea of, of work family fit might be relevant here. Uh, we could modify it a little bit to talk about sort of um, school family fit. Uh, the idea is that if these technologies allow you to be involved in your children's education in a way that you want to be, then I think they're helpful. And if, uh, if their technologies are not providing that kind of flexibility, then I would say they're, they're not promoting uh, school family fit, and maybe they're not so good. But um, yeah. So I'm curious what teachers think about the new technology. What, what's their feedback if you talk to them? I've heard sort of mixed things. Some teachers really like some of these uh, platforms. Uh, others are less enthusiastic. I think the one that has been most divisive has been this Class Dojo one. And uh, that's perhaps because it places somewhat of a burden on teachers to record during the day, sort of on the fly, which kids are behaving well and which kids are not in some sort of systematic way. And that can be difficult for them, given all the other things that they need to do. Um, and parents, um, I guess the reactions from parents may also make them somewhat ambivalent about that particular uh, program too. Uh, there are some things about it that are, uh, it's not clear how you should use it. Like Linda mentioned at one point that you can show on a projection screen the dojo points that every kid in the classroom has at the moment. I think that's probably bad practice, right? Um, uh, but you know, maybe people will learn how to use that program over time, or they'll change the options or things in ways that, that make it more useful. I haven't heard anybody, I don't think, complain about some of the other systems like Skyward and so forth that deliver grades and, and so forth. Um, uh, I think complaints about those, in my, in my experience, have been less common. But. Um, my mom is an inner city school teacher and she does use dojo and I can guarantee she hates it just as much as the kids do because um, we'll be like out to dinner and a kid will message her and be like 
like do we have can we wear this tomorrow and whatever but I also see like it is helpful because some of these kids don't even have parents in their lives and like they're raised by their grandparents who don't know how to use technology so they're they're just doing the best that they can so it in a way, for parents who usually aren't proactive in their kids' lives, like it does help, and she can reach out to them and be like, hey, like this is going on with your kid. Like I wanted to talk about it. But at the same time, yeah, like I do understand like the helicopter parent like, perspective. That's, all I, that's what I wanted to say. I'm sorry. No, I appreciate that. Yeah. Hi there. Um, so I'm wondering about all of these different companies and their products and the different realms of the educational experience, like behavior and performance and stuff like that. I was wondering, um, as people who watch it closely and are in the know about it, um, are these solutions benign? Or have you noticed like trends of acquisition and mergers and stuff like that within it? I'm just wondering about, I don't know, maybe a big brother situation and eventually with the kids and if that leads to something else in adulthood, I don't know. So I, I think we don't know the answer to that. So there's a, um, a New York Times article um, with a bunch of lawyers who um, have sued a school district in New York City based on using Dojo um, because of the fear of, the, of what, what it would be used for. So parents have to sign um, a waiver that you're willing to use Dojo, but um, you know we often don't read all of those fine prints and what it, what it means. So, uh, I don't think we've got, that's the, the risk I think that we're at, right, the, the doom part. Um, Dojo, I, I mentioned that this is an expensive endeavor um, to use these things. Dojo is free. Um, it's a, a free um, platform to teachers. They are trying to create ways in which to um, uh, make money by selling aspects of it to parents. Um, I don't know if that's actually come out yet, um, but that is what's in their, their ideas. Um, and then others use ad advertisements, so that's another piece of um, consumerism that would get in there. But I, I am concerned about the security of the data, like what are we going to be using that data for? Um, a kid gets arrested, I don't know, at 18, do we go back and look at his records and, oh, he actually was a really bad kid? Right? I, I, I don't know, it hasn't happened yet, but there are definitely people out there quite concerned. So some school districts across the country have banned Dojo. Others have mandated it, creating um, the atmosphere where teachers have to use it whether they want to or not. Do you think there's a difference in the effectiveness um, with these programs between public and private schools? It's mm. a great question. I really don't know, and I don't know the prevalence, like how often they use them in private schools. Um, so most of the things that I've uh, come across in terms of research about the use of um, and the acquisition of them have all been in um, public schools. That's not to say they don't use them there. I just don't have the answer. We have time for one more question. Oh. So, I saw your hand. so you compare the uh, new technology that we're using now to a lot of the uh, other technology that has come in, in the past, like clocks and telephones. But when you turn the telephones off or, or, you, um, or you put them away. They didn't send you notifications to uh, try and convince you to pay more attention to them. Would you say that would make a difference or would you say that th that's just another part of the technology that's going to be fine? Um, I would certainly agree that cell phones have the potential to be more intrusive than a, tele a regular telephone that's like plugged into the wall and so forth because it can make so many more noises and beep and you keep it in your pocket and things like that. Uh, but I think it's also possible if you decide to, to make it less intrusive than it is. So um, you could decide to turn off all your notifications, for instance. Um, you could decide to leave your phone um, you know, on your uh, desk at home and not carry it with you to every room that you go to. Uh, there are decisions that we could make that are perhaps in some ways uncomfortable, um, but uh, I think we, we have the capability of making the phones uh, less intrusive than they are. It's not an easy personal decision. Maybe we need some sort of support for that. But, so, <laughs> um, but the problem I have is that if the teacher is sending you that text message or that uh, ding or beep and you didn't address it right then and there and your kid goes to school and it wasn't addressed, did you put that kid um, at risk with whatever behavior um, consequence for the teacher. So our teachers send us messages all the time, science project now due tomorrow. Uh-oh, right? Like I didn't look at it 
And so if I don't have that notification and I didn't get to it, um, we're, in, we're in trouble. I think there's also a social aspect to that, that we've, our culture has developed in such a way that we expect people to be available all the time, right? So our businesses are open uh, in many cases now 24-7, and we as people are often expected to be available 24-7 also. Um, I'm not sure that's the fault of the phone per se, or certainly not the fault of these apps, um, but when you take these, these technology things and combine them with that expectation, and the underlying technology of the cell phones, then I think you can run into problems. Um, so um, I, I agree. It's not just as simple as shutting off your phone. If you do that, you may be seen as a bad parent or you know, some kind of weirdo. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>